Hello. Today I'm going to talk about statues. You know, those things we pull down and chuck in the river. Except I'm going to do something a little bit different. This is going to be the first of a series of talks, not about why we pull statues down, but why we put them up why we put them up in the first place. Because that seems to me to be the proper task of the historian, to explain who the people commemorated by the statue were and why they're commemorated. And it does lead to a very big but very simple point. Statues have become contentious primarily because of disputes about Britain's involvement in slavery and empire. Let's begin by making a simple, sweeping and undoubtedly true statement. There is not a single statue in Britain, anywhere in Britain, erected to somebody because they were a slave trader, a slave owner, a slave shipper, a slave puppeteer. There simply isn't such a thing. There are statues of people who were, I think, all of those things, but that's not why they're commemorated. They're commemorated for very different things. Today I'm going to begin by talking about the man who was probably the largest and certainly the richest slave owner in 18th century England, in 18th century London and in 18th century Jamaica which is where his plantations were. Jamaica, of course, being a British colony. The man in question is called William Beckford, and he's born in Jamaica in 1709, the son, the second son of the richest plantation owner of the day. Something like 40,000 acres, 3,000 odd slaves, that kind of extraordinary figure. He's actually the second son, which means he's sent off back to England to receive a good education to fit him for the kind of professional career that, as a second son, he would have to undertake. So he goes to Westminster School, then as now, one of the leading public schools. He's a bright boy. He's looked after, because of course his parents still in Jamaica. He's looked after very humanely by the headmaster. He becomes close friends there with one of the greatest and most liberal men of the day, uh, the future Lord Mansfield, the great judge who actually delivers a memorable judgment, uh, putting a great question mark over the legality of slavery. Of course, that's far into the future, but the two of them are and remain friends for life. He then goes from Westminster School to Balliol College, Oxford, and it seems to be at that time that he decided that the career he would pursue would be that of a doctor. And he receives a very sophisticated, the best possible uh, medical education you could get then. He goes to Holland, to Leiden, to the University of Leiden, and studies medicine there. And then really, rather unusually, he goes on to Paris to train further in the hospital of the Invalide, the equivalent of the Chelsea pensioners, uh, one of the leading and best administered hospitals of the day. But at this point, his eldest brother dies which point William becomes heir to this vast fortune. He begins by being a leading member of society um, in Jamaica. There's a representative assembly there. He's a member of it. He's, of course, an immensely rich merchant. He's also a moneylender, a money dealer. Uh, he becomes very rich, very prosperous, um, which he was by inheritance, uh, and also um, politically ambitious. And I think it's that political ambition and the scale of his wealth which leads him to decide that he become, can become an absentee. In other words, not live in Jamaica, but continue to run his uh, vast estates by agents there, by letter, and to move permanently to Britain. And he does so uh, in the 1740s, and he settles in London. He quickly becomes, because of his vast wealth, um, he's richer than almost all, apart from the very greatest of the aristocrats, and he undoubtedly will have more ready cash available, I think, than any of them. 
Anyway, he becomes a great figure in the politics of the City of London. Uh, he's elected an alderman. He's returned to Parliament and eventually becomes Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor of London. No mean thing. Twice over. So here is this immensely rich merchant. Um, acquires, of course, a big landed estate, uh, Fonthill Splendens, which he builds magnificently. And when the house burns down, well, he rebuilds it, remarking allegedly that in a spare drawer I've got £50,000. So I just rebuild, refurnish. He gives magnificent banquets. A bit like, it's a bit really like one of those great figures in Roman politics, like a Crassus or whatever. Huge, ostentatious banquets. He's a man of very abstemious habits. You know, when you look at him, when we look at that statue, the statue in the Guild Hall, he's really rather, rather gaunt. Um, uh, but his banquets are on the scale of a Roman banquet. And of course, the high aristocracy of fashion all turn up to enjoy this lavish hospitality. But there's usually a little bit of a sneer behind their hands because, of course, he's a colonial, isn't he? He's got a slightly funny accent because he comes from Jamaica. And he's a bit vulgar, isn't he? So here is this immensely rich man uh, cutting a major figure in London and increasingly in the national politics to which his seat in Parliament gives him access. Now, which side in politics is this man, this hugely rich slave owner? Which side is he going to be on? Well, nowadays, we would think he'd be some sort of dyed, dyed in the wool, crusty, crusty equivalent of Brexiteer, hardline Tory. Well, he's vaguely Toryish, but then the labels of Tory and Whig were undergoing extraordinary flux at this point. And he's... This is something that I hope will surprise you. He is the great proponent of liberty. The slave owner campaigns for liberty, for the rights of what he calls the freeborn Englishman. He argues that for the first time, uh, with the fall of the Stuarts and the coming to the throne of the House of Hanover, Englishmen were free and had the right to be free and were able to maintain their freedom. What does he mean by this? Well, he campaigns vigorously, passionately against the landed oligarchy that dominates English politics at this point. He wants a broader franchise. He wants annual parliaments, frequent elections. He wants what he wants. He calls them, it sounds a little bit like Boris Johnson with hardworking people. He wants the middling sort to get their proper share, their proper cause it their voice in politics. What does he mean by the middling sort? Well, he means the superior members of the professions, the country gentleman, the yeoman farmer, the prosperous farmer, the citizen, all these sorts of people. And he wants them, and he thinks they should have, a voice, arguably a dominant voice in English politics. He talks about them, of course, as English politics. And he is passionately of the view that these people who tended to be looked down upon a bit, you know, as now by the educated upper classes, uh, tended to be looked down on. He argues for their common sense, for the quality of their judgment, for their sense of the right direction of the country. So slave owner, but campaigner for liberty domestically. This allies him with some extraordinary other figures in the politics of the period. His principal alliance is with somebody whose name reverberates through English politics, William Pitt, Earl of Chatham, the first Earl of Chatham, the great commoner. William Pitt is the, uh, the great insider-outsider of the politics of this period. He is above all a campaigner for Britain's greatness and glory, for the greatness and glory of empire, the development of Britain's power. He's an ardent enemy of the French. He sees, I think correctly, that empire isn't Britain just 
going out and conquering things. It's above all a fight for supremacy between the two great European powers, as they now are, of Britain, England and France. And Pitt is determined that England shall win. And one of his principal allies is Beckford, is William Beckford. And indeed, it seems to be Beckford who, I think more than anybody else, is responsible for Pitt's very particular approach to imperial strategy. Beckford is constantly pushing Pitt to espouse a doctrine that you can fight France on two fronts. You can fight France in Europe, but you should also and simultaneously be using the strength of the British Navy to tackle France and rob it of its colonies, particularly, of course, to rob it of the rival sugar islands in the West Indies, but also in Canada, in India and everywhere else. And this, I think, is something which is fundamentally important. This policy reaches its great triumph in the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 63, and particularly in the year of victories of 1759. That's the year that the French lose their hold in India and the French are defeated, are driven out of, well, the French government, not the French settlers, are driven out of Canada with the triumph of General Wolfe uh, before Quebec and the heights of Abraham and so on. And that's the vindication of the policy that links Beckford with uh, William Pitt. And that also, I think, explains the group of statues, the first of which is that of Beckford, that we're going to talk about. Where is the statue? Well, the statue is in the Guild Hall of the City of London. This has been the centre of the city's government since the Middle Ages, but it's dominated by a series of huge statues, principal one of which uh, is Beckford. There's also William Pitt there. What is Beckford? What are Pitt doing there? Why are they there together? What was the cement between them? Well, I've talked about a specific kind of imperial policy, but it goes beyond that. It's described best by the uh, great 18th century politician, uh, man of letters and eventually great political philosopher Edmund Burke. And Edmund Burke is one of the outstanding stylists of the day. And when Pitt in turn, Pitt the Elder, comes to die and has his great statue put up in Guildhall, it is, it is Burke who actually writes the epitaph. And the epitaph includes these extraordinary words. It is under Pitt that commerce is united with and made to flourish by war united with and made to flourish by war. This takes us to the heart of the matter. The extraordinary driver of Britain's economic growth and Britain's uh, um, transformation, the transformation of the world which begins in the 18th century, is this marriage of commerce, of empire and of money. That's what Beckford is all about. That's what Pitt is all about. But both of them are also, and I come back to this point, about liberty. The culminating moment of Beckford's career is right at the end of his career, um, uh, in 1770, the year in which he dies at the age of 61. That year, there's an extraordinary political struggle between another ally of Beckford and Pitt, John Wilkes, the great agitator for liberty, uh, the voluptuary, uh, scandalous life, um, uh, a mocker, a satirist, um, and generally, altogether, depending on your view, either a very good thing or a very bad one. He scandalises um, the court of the 18th century by his overt attack on the king, his attack on Scots, the influence of Scots in politics, uh, and so on and so on. Anyway, uh, he is returned to Parliament, and Parliament is the ministry, is so shocked by his return as MP for the county of Middlesex, that's the bit immediately outside London in those days. It's now what we call more or less Greater London. Uh, the government and Parliament are so shocked by Wilkes's return as an MP that he is formally expelled from the House 
and the runner-up is declared legitimately elected as an MP. This occasions a huge outburst of popular feeling and a great struggle in the city. Uh, Pitt, of course, is very firmly on the side of Wilkes because Pitt is the minister who, I think, really for the first time is, if you like, forced on the king by popular opinion. And here is popular opinion outraged by the driving of its then principal representative, John Wilkes, out of Parliament. We have, of course, a Beckford. Beckford at this point is Lord Mayor of London for the second time. What does he do? He leads a formal delegation to court to confront the new, relatively inexperienced king, George III, just into the first decade of his very long reign, and to upbraid him in the politest form, of course, for supporting his government in removing um, Wilkes from the house. The king, politely but formally, dismisses him. What does he do? Well, he doesn't back down. Another bigger, more important delegation comes from the city and remonstrates with the king again. The king similarly rejects the remonstrance. Of course, what Beckford is supposed to do is to bow politely and walk backwards and retire. He does no such thing. He delivers an outrageous breach of protocol. He delivers an extempore speech in which he, giving the extempore speech, is a as I said, a complete breach of protocol. But more importantly is what he actually says. He says that anybody who persuades the king that the city of London is not a loyal and passionate supporter of the monarchy is betraying the public interest and is an enemy of the glorious, listen to these words, the glorious and most necessary revolution. Glorious and most necessary. The king's face goes red, but he keeps quiet. Beckford is dismissed. Now, there are two things about that speech which are astonishing. One is the brutal reminder of revolution, the glorious revolution, which had overthrown James II, and there's a very strong hint there, isn't there, who famously interferes with Parliament. There's a very strong hint there that if he's not careful, George III will find himself sharing the same fate of dethronement in another glorious and necessary revolution. There's that. But also the charge of alienating the king's subjects, and in particular the city, from the king, well, it's worse than James II. Those are the charges which are levied against, first of all, the Earl of Strafford, the principal minister of Charles I. Strafford loses his head in the Civil War, and a version of that charge is levied against, well, Charles I himself, Charles Stuart, when he is tried for his life and executed. So you have that double sensational reminder of the glorious revolution and the Civil War and the execution of the king. Shortly after that, Beckford dies, seems to catch a chill or something, on his way to his grand country house at Fonthill Splendens, and the city and Pitt, who had acclaimed his speech, uh, decide that he has to have a statue. And the statue, this statue, which is in contention, because of course, to remind you, Beckford is a great slave owner, this statue is put up, and what appears on it? Nothing to do with him as a merchant and nothing to do with him as a slave owner. No, there is a literal transcription of that impromptu speech with the words just and necessary revolution heightened. The slave owner and liberty and the campaigner for liberty. The two go together in the 18th century. Even more strikingly, of course, they are the core of the American Revolution. Pitt is a great supporter of, within limits, of the American colonists, uh, which is why his name appears all over America. Uh, from Pittsburgh downwards, he's responsible for the capture of the, the great Ohio lands uh, from France, uh, and in fact the, the, the permanent defeat of the French alliance with the Indians. And 
Beckford himself. This alliance again of colonial interest, slavery and liberty. It's caught most brilliantly by Dr Johnson. Dr Johnson, the great man of letters of the 18th century, crusty, die-hard, seriously Christian old Tory. He, of course, hates the American, uh, uh, rebelling American colonists and colonialists. Uh, he writes a major pamphlet uh, f in favour of the war against the colonies called uh, Taxation No Tyranny. That's the right of the English Parliament to tax the colonies, the thing which is principally being rebelled against with the Boston Tea Party and so on. And in it, there is this extraordinary line in Johnson's pamphlet. Nobody yelps for liberty more loudly than a driver of slaves. That's the paradox. It's the paradox of 18th century English politics. It's the paradox of the American Revolution. And it is the paradox of the statue in London Guildhall of William Beckford. <laughs>